Hallelujah. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hi. Good morning, everyone. I want to first say that I am a 1992 proud graduate of Penile Program. Amen. Yes. Yes, thank you, Lord. Yes. Also one of the lead counselors here at Penile, and it was the only drug addiction that brought me here. One of the things I found out when I, well, actually I knew what really came to light was my like, dislike, I might even say hatred for my own self. Didn't like myself very much and also blame God for that dislike. Um, but thank God for the truth. The truth to do what? Set you free. I so agree with uh, Hosea 4, 6 when God says that my people perish because of lack of knowledge. Ignorance can get you killed. <laughs> Ignorance can be very dangerous and painful. So anyway, I want to talk about um, love is in need of love. What'd I say? Yes, love is in need of love. It'll make sense. <laughs> oh boy, praise God. The most important component in life is environment. Y'all know I've talked about that before. Environment. Environment is so important that God created it first. He created it before he created air um, for the I mean, he created air, which is environment, before he created the birds that he put in it. The same thing with soil. He created the soil before he put the plants. Environment is what sustains the thing. Everything that exists was designed to live in a pre, pre, uh, pre-described, prescribed rather, environment. All countries manifest their uniqueness through, through culture, culture. Culture is observed and dis- observable and distinctive. Culture is also both personal and corporate. Culture is revealed in the essence of people and culture was created first before people, God put people in it. Every country has a currency by which it conducts business. The currency of the kingdom of heaven is faith. However, the culture of the kingdom of heaven is love. You have faith, you believe, that's great. That's wonderful. You need to have faith. But faith must operate through the culture of love. Faith actually cannot work where love isn't present. Let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3. See if we can prove that point. You get that up for us? There we go. Paul speaking. He said, If I speak in the tongues of men or angel of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clinging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have what? What's the prophet? 
nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give every, I'm sorry, give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is that important. We can practice all the religious rituals like giving, prayer, but if love is not present, as the scripture says, it profits me nothing. So love is more important than faith. Love is really important. Here's another verse I want you to look at. It's Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Paul again writing, he says, For if we are in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but only faith activated and expressed through working through love. So Paul is telling us that our rituals or non-rituals aren't important, but faith has to work through love. We, we, can, all, we can do all the religious, r religious rituals like fasting and prayer, as I already said, but these things can be nullified if love is not present. The, the whole operation of the kingdom of God is in an atmosphere of love. So love is the culture of the kingdom of heaven in which faith functions, and we must live by faith, and faith, can, again, can only work if there's an environment of love. Think about you in your own life and things you do. We're going to get deeper into this thing of love, and um, we're going to make some points here. So, without love, everything shuts down. Remember, maybe you didn't think about that before, never had that thought. Everything just shuts down. Self-love is a product of self-worth. Now, you remember I said before, one of the things I discovered when I came to Penile was that I didn't like myself. I allow other people, and some of you can relate to that. You know, people tell you you're no good, you'll never amount to nothing. You know, my father wasn't around. I didn't meet my father until I was 16 years old. And when I did, I was very angry. He wasn't in my life. But all these negativities and all this input and all this opinions of all the people helped shape who I was and I was a person who didn't like himself very much you know we found in addiction mostly the time root one of the root causes of pain low self esteem abuse abandonment issues like that well I, I checked all the boxes <laughs> Thank God for Penile. So, if you believe you have worth, then you, f and then you fall in love with yourself. If you don't, then you hate yourself. Can't have it both ways. And you, the other thing is you can only love people to the degree in which you love yourself. So if I didn't love myself, I really couldn't love you. But thank God, God changed all of that. Hallelujah. So you, know, you can never discover your self-worth until you discover God. And that's what happened here at Penal. I had a face-to-face -face encounter with the only true and living God, and my life began to change. 
Praise God. So because God is the source of our life and value and worth depends on the material that you have. Let me give you an example. Uh, speak to the ladies because they like to shop. And if you think like my wife, you got shoes. You probably got, a lot of you ladies got shoes stored away. You probably got a whole closet just full of shoes. <laughs> okay, let's look at this. Uh, right now, let's say you're in a shoe store and you want to buy some shoes. I lost some of y'all already, right? <laughs> okay, so you, you go to the rack. There's, uh, there's all sorts of shoes there. Now, you find a pair of shoe, leather shoes. Leather comes from cows. They have one price on them. You look at another pair of shoes. Ooh, they're made from snake skin. Then you look, you find another pair of shoes, and they made it out of gators. All right. <laughs> well, depending on what the shoes are made of or the material they're made from will determine its value. Okay? Or their worth. Different shoes have different values and different worth, depending on the material of which they're made. True? Because cows are more common than crocodiles, of course, the cost would be different or gators. I don't know the difference, but anyway. Gators probably cost more than a cow because they're more valuable. So you, you know the source of where something, when you know the source of where something comes from, you know its worth. Rocks, for example, come from mountains. Rocks aren't worth anything. But diamonds, on the other hand, now they have value. If I took a rock and broke it, I have more nothing. I had nothing, I break it, I still got nothing. But if I take a diamond and cut it, it still maintains its value. So the source of a thing determines its worth. Your self-worth should never be created by society, by your teachers, family members, friends, and those in your environment. And if you don't know any better, they'll, they'll do exactly that. They'll, you, they'll take, they make opinions about you, tell you what you can do, what you can't do. And when we're young, we're very gullible. And those seeds can be planted in us and bring damage to our life. So that was my problem. I had all this stuff in my head and all these lies and all these opinions. And they helped shape who I thought I was. Here's a note for you young people. Listen up. Social media cannot give you self-worth. It often leads to social comparison, seeking validation through likes and comments and exposure, even cyberbullying. This complex interplay impacts their self, your self-worth and confidence, contributing to feelings of inadequacy, depression, anxiety, Loneliness, which affects your overall well-being. So you got to be careful with that social media when you get involved in that. Again, society through social media or different people uh, that you don't even know are trying to in influence you. That's what they call them, right? Influencers. And you buy into that and they can help direct the course of your life and you don't even realize what's happening sometimes. 
Matter of fact, many young people are committing suicide because of opinions and things people say and write about them. How tragic. We allow people to give us worth. And here's where love becomes a problem when you're looking for other people to give it to you. That's, it becomes a problem. You're looking for worth. You're looking for love, but you don't have love. You're expecting the people to give you love. And, you, and anybody who's alive today, got a pulse, know the world is going straight to hell. Matter of fact, the scriptures say hell is even enlarging itself because of the craziness that's going on in society. So self-love is determined by your source and where you came from. This is why you can't find, you can't find it without God. God is the source of your self-worth. I think we ought to give him a praise for that. People ask you where you come from. I'm originally from Baltimore. Some people say Pittsburgh, this and that. No. You came from heaven. I think you want to go back and visit, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> God created us in his image, in his likeness, in his substance, his nature. And this means that God is the source of true love for yourself. God is the source of love. We have a sign over there. God is love. This is why the Bible says he is love. If you want to know the value of a thing, check out how much they're offering for it. And we do it all the time. We go shopping, right? You see some. Check the price. Oh, man, I can't afford that. Oh, you know, check the price. You see what it's worth. So guess what God did? So God decided he wanted to buy you back. Hmm. Christ didn't die for you to give you value. He died for you to prove your value. Yes, this is why he had to give himself. The Bible says he is the express image of God. So the only one who could, he could use to trade for you was that which was equal to you. <laughs> you can always tell what you are worth by how much it was, what was paid for you, his life. And we're getting the meat of things, what you're really worth. I'm glad I got this revelation while I was here at Penal. And I hope God has given you one for yourself. I no longer hate or devalue myself. I'm a rich man <laughs> because God is wealthy. We are as valuable as God is valued. He paid himself to buy us back. God truly is love. Let me do a little demonstration for you. See this bottle? I see the bottle of water? Okay, hold on. That's what God did. This bottle rep represents God. This is you.
poured himself into you. And whatever, whatever he's worth, you're worth. Yeah, the value of that liquid in the glass is awesome. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done, oh God. So the most important person for you to love really starts is you. And I'm going to show you why. Let's look at Matthew chapter 22. Verses 35 through 40. You got it? Okay, it says, one of, the, one of them, an expert in the law. And this is one of the Pharisees. Now, this was a question that was asked of Christ Jesus. And the Pharisees, again, you know, they studied the law. The Pharisees were so strict when it came to the law, they extracted from the Old Testament, from the prophets and from Moses and all that they could find in the, in the um, Old Testament laws. There were 669 laws they extracted from the scriptures. And their goal was to prove themselves to be righteous so they were trying to keep all 669 laws. Now, that's an impossible task. But they wanted to be righteous. So this uh, expert in the law came to Jesus to test him. Next one. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? You mean out of 669 laws, he wanted to know which one was the greatest of all of them. So Jesus answered. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Oh, oh, and by the way, there's a second one. Well, wait a minute. He asked them what was the one commandment. Well, Jesus had two answers for one question. He said, and the second is like, is like the first one. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, if you do this, all the law of the prophets hang on these two commandments. You follow these two, you satisfy the 669. Wow. Love, this is what he said. He says, love God, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love God, love yourself. And love your neighbor. That's the correct order. Love God, love yourself, and love your neighbor. That's what he said. The mistake that we often make is we try to love people and don't love ourselves. That's the, that's, that's, you remember I said before, we go looking for love. So we want people to love us. But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says, no, you got to love you before you can, I can't give you something I don't have. So to, let's start with the first one. To love God means to pursue him. To pursue God. To learn about him. Learn his nature. Learn his qualities. Spend time with him. Get to know him. Learn how he thinks. 
what his desires are. I mean, to know God, it, 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 that's deep. You can't do that in a minute. Study him. Then he said, love your neighbor as you love yourself, meaning the same degree in which you love yourself is to be exhibited to your neighbor. We need to stop trying to love others first. This is the reason we've been hurt. We don't love ourselves and we need people to love us. This is why a lot of us can say we've been manipulated, abused, hurt, mistreated, because you put yourself in a vulnerable position looking for somebody to fill a void that they can't fill. Hmm. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the measure of love. Let's look at 1 John 4.10. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Next. Dear friends, since... God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his, his spirit. Okay, love your brother. This is a law. This is a commandment. This is a law. And God has given that to us to follow. And to do that, we have to understand that the human, we humans have basic needs that are, that are inherent in our nature. We're talking about how we're going to love now. I'm going to give you a list. Again, inherent, these are basic needs each one of us have. Number one, you can write them down if you like. Humans need to be valued. Every person is valuable. Every human needs to be respected. All humans need to be affirmed. We all need affirmation. Even God did that for his son Jesus. You remember on the Mount of Transfiguration? He said to the three, Peter, James, and John who was with him, he said, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Every human needs to be touched. I'm reminded of the lepers that came to Jesus. And you know about leprosy, they had to live in a colony. They had to be separated. And when they approached Jesus for healing, the first thing Jesus did was touch them. It may have been years since he felt a human hand touch him. Think about how valuable that is sometimes. I remember one day uh, I was going through, well, this I've been going through plenty of days, but <laughs> this particular day <laughs> stood out in my mind because I was walking through the building and Pastor Spellman happened to come out of Dr. Spellman's office and I was just coming upstairs and I was having a rough time. Anybody can relate? I mean, I was having a rough time. And pastor saw me, he said, Elder Bill. And he came and he just hugged me. And when he did that, I, I, I just like melted. 
I started to cry. He didn't say a word. He just hugged me. It felt so good. Then he let me go and went on about his business. A whole day changed. A touch can be very powerful. Very powerful. All humans need to be accepted. And you know this as a kid, right? You know, they play in a game and all, you come along and nobody chews you. That happened to me a lot. I wasn't that greatest. But ever happened to you? That's an awful feeling when you're not accepted. You're not part of a group. You're rejected. That rejection is a bad boy, isn't it? That hurts. Ooh. Every, need, every human needs to be accepted. Every human, be, human being needs to feel important. This is a good one for you husbands. I know my wife comes to me sometimes and says, Honey, I need to talk. And the Super Bowl's on. Oh, man. Time is awful. <laughs> it's like, you're thinking, can this wait? I mean, <laughs> you know what I've learned? I cut it off, turn around, and let her know through my actions, you're important. Yeah. You're important. Her knees go straight to the top of the list. Everything else got to go. That makes her feel important, respected, valued, all of that, right? Every human being needs to be recognized. All humans need to be connected to feel that they are a part of something. That's important. This is innate quality that we have. All humans need to be included. If I'm not, if, if they don't feel included, they will leave you and they won't be happy. This list is not wants. These are needs. A need is that which requires, which is required to function. In other words, if anyone lacks any of these they start to malfunction. You know, a need is like uh, um, gasoline for your car. And we all been there. If you don't, you got this $25,000 car sitting out there and you don't have any gas, it's going to malfunction. It ain't going nowhere. It's going to malfunction. So if you equate that, look at that, the needs that we just talked about as that important for human functioning. Now this list is how you love someone. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So if my wife feels that she's not valued, if a wife feels that she's not valued, her husband starts to malfunction. Or if she doesn't feel accepted by her husband or vice versa, again, they begin to malfunction. Oh, we get the picture, I think. Again, their needs. So, I'll be wrapping this up in a minute here. All right, so let's talk about what is true love? Well, love, I'm going to give you a definition. True love is a decision to meet the basic needs of another human being at every opportunity. That list that I just gave you, those are, you need to write that down, study it, memorize it, put it on your refrigerator, whatever. Because whenever you meet somebody, you're obligated to, to address that list. Think of it that way. 
Again, love is a decision to meet the basic needs of another human being at every opportunity. Just work the list and you'll be successful. Just work the list and you won't have to tell people you love them. They'll know it because of the list. Love in marriage, that's a little different. Love in your marriage is a commitment and dedication to meet the needs of another person of the opposite sex, that's important, <laughs> for the rest of your life. I'll read that again for you married folks. Love and marriage is a commitment and dedication to meet the basic needs of another person of the opposite sex for the rest of your life. When you made that commitment to them. And for those who are single, you, the list still applies. You meet the needs of whoever you run into. You should make them feel important. You should respect them. You should affirm them. You should recognize them. And the list goes on. So why do we need to love? You remember I said love is in need of love. Wherever a thing comes from, it must receive from and give to where it came from. Now, that sounds a little tricky, right? Let me read it again. Wherever a thing comes from, it must receive from and give to where it came from. Give you an example. A plant. A plant comes from the soil. A plant feeds from the soil. And a plant dies and go back to the soil. Got that? Okay, when it dies, we came out of God. God is love, therefore we receive from God and give back to God. You are love, so you need to be love and to give love and to receive love to fulfill and not to malfunction. Love is only complete when the receiver is just like the giver. Again, love it's only complete. There's a cycle there, right? When the receiver, the person who receives the love, has to do what? Give it back. God loves us, and in turn, he expects us. Does the scripture say we love him? He loved us first, so we in turn love him back. That's the completeness of love. And then he says, now, what I did for you do for each other. That's what you do for each other. Every day. 365 days. He says, love your friends, love your neighbors, love your enemies. And by the way, I know I, I'm a dog lover. We got some in the house. And I know, I love my dog. <laughs> I love my dog. But your dog can't love you. He can't. He can't. <laughs> I got a debate going over in this corner over here. So. <laughs> the Bible says for every animal that was made had a mate. But for Adam, there was no, nothing suitable for him. Now, he had a whole earth of animals. 
didn't fit. Love has, okay. This is why God created you. <laughs> he says, you can't, give you can't give love to something that can't give it back. The cycle's not complete. So there wasn't anything suitable for Adam. So God had to make another human being that's capable of loving. So this is why God created you and me. God is love and God needed someone to love. And the one who receives the love he has is you and I who are able to give it back. Imagine God's motivation for our creation is love. So God didn't decide to love us. He created us to love us. So dying for us was easy. Come on, give him a praise. <laughs> 